is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Millions of college graduates in Africa are jobless. Their degrees have turned out to be just worthless pieces of paper. Employers say they're half-baked and do not possess the necessary skill sets for the jobs on offer. And there is a background to all of this. Now, at independence, many African countries inherited a largely colonial form of education designed by the colonizers to respond to the needs of the colony. But a rapidly evolving labor market has exposed its shortcomings. The quest for change is now gathering momentum across the continent, with examples Kenya and Uganda taking the lead in East Africa. This week on Talk Africa, we explain what decolonizing the education system entails, how African countries are going about it, and the expected outcomes of the undertaking. I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Well, Kenya is overhauling its education system to empower learners to have more practical skills that will help them when they start working. It's adopting a competency-based curriculum tailored to tap into the individual strengths and talents of learners to boost their mastery of the skills required in the labor market. But as CGTN's Nick Mudimba now tells us, the Kenyan education experts are divided over the new curriculum's suitability. Let's take a listen. Kenya is rolling out its competency-based curriculum that aims to have a holistic learner who can fit well into the job market. At a private primary school in Nairobi, a CBC class is underway. The pupils are taken through lessons. It's a mix from making beads, learning mathematics, and even playing music. Teachers have the tough task of ensuring the new system is properly rolled out. It is a beautiful thing, only that if I were in a position, I would say, let the teacher facilitate, let the teacher be supported, especially in terms of uh, making the materials, because it is over overwhelming. The competency-based curriculum has made Kenyan parents to be closer to their children than ever before. This is due to the hands-on situation that are given by the teachers from school. For now, they're hoping that it will change the perception of so many learners compared to the 844, which is mainly writing notes, dictating, and of course, cramming for exams. Education experts, however, have some reservations about the competency-based curriculum. The introduction of CBC um, was, you know, fulfilling a national desire to change what was on offer in education because there was a mismatch, an apparent mismatch, which may be true or not true, about what 844 was producing and what industry required. So in the process of changing, CBC was settled upon as a mode of instruction, but the problem came in because nobody explained to the nation why CBC, because there are so many other models. Why did we settle on this? The biggest question that has never been answered up to now is a design question. What is the philosophy of CBC? What is CBC founded on? Janet Mumbi is a career woman and a mother of three pupils who are all learning under the new curriculum. She spends eight hours at work every weekday. In the evening, she helps her children do their homework. The, the child does not miss out on anything. When we come to these subjects like the arts and this and um, music, where the home science, they're not just doing a lot of uh, notes, it's also the practical part of it. So I think a child has, and you know once you do an activity, you don't forget. There's the learning, there's the cooking, there's the planting of things, which before would just learn types of plants and all that, but now they're actually doing it. And there's, when you do it, when there's, applica there's the application part, there's a chance that that child will never forget. And they relate with it. And I think that is something that CBC is trying to, to make sure that the children understand, not just reading about it, but they actually practice it. For Mumbi, she hopes the new curriculum will continue sharpening her children's prowess so that in the future, they feed into the demands of the ever-competitive changing world. Nick Mudimba, CGTN, Nairobi.
Well, let's now bring in our panel of experts from Johannesburg, Edmund Terem Umar, PhD candidate at the University of Johannesburg in Nairobi. Joining us via Zoom, Peter Amunga, education activist, and Leandro Komakech, team leader at the Leandro Associate Limited, joining us from Kampala. Gentlemen, a warm welcome and thank you for being a part of this conversation. Peter, if I may start off with you, because I want to begin this conversation by understanding the current concept of the education system that exists in Africa. What are the characteristics of the education system that is colonial in nature on the continent? The colonial masters that colonized Africa, they gave us the language of instruction. So we use that language to teach our learners and they also gave us the mode, the pedagogy that we used to teach. So we are all African countries that were colonized still depend or are still dependent on their colonial masters for the education systems. And it becomes very hard to talk about decolonizing or coming out of it because we still depend on them up to this very moment. Most of the content that we get from our former colonial uh, masters is very irrelevant. We teach some literature. Uh, European literature, we teach history, Latin American history, we teach about European history. Most of it does not apply to our, our situation, our climate. We teach even the four seasons, for example, in the, in, the, in the European nations. Yet in Africa, we don't experience those four seasons. So you discover that the, as much as we borrow so much from those colonial masters, the, the content that we receive from them is not applicable in many areas, most times, we are teaching things that are like out of outer space and our learners actually are most times at loss when trying to follow what is being taught. Leandro, let me get your view here because Uganda is changing its curriculum. Which aspects of the education system derived from its colonial past is Uganda unhappy about, for instance? Coloniality in its uh, entire package was all about subjugation. And subjugation was about making sure that our minds were taken over by other people. And therefore, out of that is when we began to accept that it is good to have uh, an education system that is foreign, and yet we think it is good for us. And so from that basis is, is when we, we went deep into the, into the poisoning of, of the African mind and in believing that anything indigenous, whether in knowledge or any context of culture and everything else, was completely useless. So there are so many other components that still are invisible, but it still affects the future of our learners in, in Africa. And in Uganda in particular, when the education system was introduced, it was supposed to actually facilitate our clerical works uh, to, with the colonial masters. With a little bit of uh, technical which was at a very low level right now of course through many processes we have gone through commissions that were put in place at pre-independence and then after independence we then took on the process where we took too much of uh, of the teaching that produced uh, white collar uh, jobs as opposed to blue collar so at the end of the day we find ourselves in a catch-22 where the number of those that have gone through these processes cannot fit what is legitimately required in the market. All right. And that is why Uganda, actually in 1989, I went through to change its uh, education system by launching the first paper that was called the, the Kajubi Report of 1989 that brought in place many changes in education system. And uh, through those processes, we have begun to see that government has uh, embraced in all its entirety a competence-based process that builds the learner from the beginning to have a practical thinking and, and, uh, and knowledge that then can make that learner, at the end of all the processes or courses, right. somebody worthwhile to be valuable in the labor market. Right. I want to bring in Edmund here. Edmund, yes. we know that most schools in Africa uh, are too focused on a European or Western way of doing things. I, I, I want to get your perspective here as a student. Should they adopt a more African or global perspective? What is your experience? Yes, uh, it is my contention that uh, the harm has already been done. But we must also realize that we live in a global community and globalization is taking shape in Africa. Right. 
And because global globalization is taking shape in Africa, there is a transfer of values, transfer of, um, of educational values, and so on. So it is my contention that as if we want to have a more pragmatic, um, decolonized educational system, then we should adopt a, a certain form of what I would want to call a global decolonization. And here, the global decolonization that I want to think here is that um, everyone should take part in this decolonization process, both the West the, uh, and the East and, let's say, Sub-Saharan Africa and the northern part of Africa. They should take part in this discourse because it is pointless for us to bring our indigenous knowledge system into the conversation when in the Western world, they don't even understand what is that. Because no. currently, since there is this transfer of values, transfer of a um, knowledge system, um, it has always been, a, in, a, in a horizontal way, it has always been from top to bottom. So we must try to see how we can adopt a bottom to top approach and a top to bottom approach. Those two must go concomitantly. Let me get Peter's view here. Peter, do you agree on that, though, that uh, it, it, it beats logic um, you know, to try and um, export our education, indigenous education system to a continent or to a region that doesn't understand who we are? African culture is very diverse. It's very different. We, we have, like in Kenya, for example, we have almost over of, of 40, 40 tribes. All of these tribes have their different cultures. We can't, uh, for example, talk about uh, one culture or one uh, w having a system that is fitting all those 40 uh, tribes. But what can bring us together is what we, what we saw in the, in the European revolution, what they call the industrial revolution, the cultural revolution, the agrarian revolution. Africa needs to undergo a revolution that will change it to make sure that uh, the that brings them to be a united people to know what is good for them. For example, we have the Maasai culture, for example. How will you make this, the education system fit, say, uh, uh, just one culture in, in Kenya called the Maasai culture? Right. So what I'm trying to say is this. Yes, it beats logic. And two, we are still dependent on those foreign masters to fund for us all the way to, you know, the, the, the methodologies to train our teachers. We are still dependent on the World Bank. We are still dependent on the IMF. Right. We are still dependent on European donors so that we are able, they are the ones who dictate to us now what kind of methodology, what kind of training, what kind of labor market we need. And so they, are the, they still have a way to reach out to us, even if we try to to get independent or to go our own way. We are not able to do it because they still control the money, the pass. He who pays the piper plays the tune, gets the tune. Let me bring in uh, Lagos here. Uh, Richard Adeyinka, founder of a CEO Data Home and Research and Communications, is joining us uh, from uh, Lagos. As independents, though, it did seem that the systems of education worked fairly well in responding uh, to, to the needs of the post-independence era. However, is it still relevant? What is your experience as an employer, Richard? Oh, well, uh, right now, the problem we are facing is how to transfer this knowledge from the classroom to the field, to the markets, so we can benefit from whatever skill has been transferred to our learners in the classroom. But the problem that cuts across that I have seen is that here, whatever we have learned in class, we are finding it difficult to translate them to practice. Whatever we have learned, we cannot use it to develop our society. Uh, we have had cases where our policymakers have argued that the mode of delivery in our classroom is not adequate, that we should use our indigenous language to teach our learners in the classroom. So it therefore suggests that the knowledge is inadequate, understanding is lost with languages. You know, when you use English language, for instance, to train a child in Nigeria, 
is battling with his or her indigenous language and at the same time learning English language. Right. Whereas those in China or in elsewhere, they don't have to do that. They use their language to train them from beginning so they understand it, they can see it. Now, in our own case, we are battling with language issue and then the person that is transferring the knowledge is also using the same language. Sometimes, this, the understanding of the language through which the knowledge is delivered is not adequate. Right. And meaning is lost in the process of transferring this knowledge to our learners. Leandro, let me get your perspective here because we are seeing African countries like Kenya and Uganda undertaking review of their curriculum structures. Why are these countries seeing a need to change their systems 60 years after independence? Have the systems, uh, you know, have Africa's education systems failed to evolve? The challenge here is while we evolve to get into a better space, we need to understand our philosophy of education. Are we producing, uh, are we producing just for the sake or we have an objective that is tailored to the market at present in Africa. That is what is very key in shaping our, our education and in ensuring that when we deliver the curricula that matters, then at the end of the day, we see the youth of Africa becoming competent in the world market. And I think that is very, very important because we need a human resource constituency that can have uh, employability not only in Africa, but in the world stage. And, and right. that is uh, the challenge we have to grapple with. Of course, notwithstanding the issue of uh, coloniality, decoloniality is, is quite an important area that we need to guard right. uh, well. That while we do it, we can pick some of the positive values that uh, we, we, we got along and then add on to our worldview, our African values, that are imperatively important in the growth of the, the human potential in Africa. And I All think right. this is very key as we develop through, though we have taken long to do that. All right, gentlemen, we're going to leave it there for the moment. We'll take a short break. And when we come back, we will look at whether the current education systems in Africa are meeting the demands of the job market and the changing global labor dynamics. Stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back to Talk Africa. Now let's continue with our discussion. Still with us in Johannesburg, Edmund Terem Umar in Nairobi, joining us via Zoom, Peter Amunga, and in Kampala, Leandro Komekech. Peter, let me start off with you now. How would African countries, though, undertake the task of uh, changing a curriculum? Is it a reality that can be achieved on the continent, given the fact that it has been the same curriculum that has existed in many countries uh, for about 60 years? Curriculum implementation depends on also political goodwill. It also depends on the peace prevailing in the country, the leadership of the country, the economy of the country. The competence-based curriculum that we are trying to introduce in most of our African countries is a very good curriculum. The problem we are having is that we are not able to carry out the proper implementation plan, the pilot stage the research stage, and all these stages are not being followed. Many times we have got political leaders in our countries who some of them want to leave behind a legacy. And so they rush it up. Now, but curriculum implementation does not need rushing. Right. It needs proper planning. And that is what we are lacking. Quality education is made up of three things. Quality teachers, they must first be trained properly and trained to deliver that curriculum. Quality tools, we must have the tools to deliver a curriculum, a quality education. And in most times in Africa, we don't have those tools. And number three, quality environment. Environment here, I mean the classrooms, the, the atmosphere, and everything that goes around the teaching learning process. Like in Kenya, where, where I am right now, 
The problem we are having with the curriculum implementation, the CBC, is that we, we rushed it. We tried to please some political leaders. And because of that, we lost it. We may have to start afresh so that we can get it properly. Because our technology and our skills are different from what people maybe in China, maybe in Japan, maybe in Finland want. Uh, if we could tailor to fit our specific needs All right. as Africa, it would be better. All right. Edmund, let me get your thinking here in terms of the objective um, of the education system. Are we just, um, you know, as Leandro is putting it, are we just producing uh, students for the sake of it? Or do we actually have an objective today in the same vein as the colonialists had an objective with their education system? The, the objective here for this, their educational system is, uh, is to ensure that they feed Africans with with knowledge because Africans are unable to produce knowledge for themselves. So now we need to reorient ourselves about that. And how can we reorient ourselves about that? There are certain things, there are certain values that we can pick when, uh, when we go back to pre-colonial society. And one of some of the values, the educational values, is the ability of, um, of acquiring skills for ourselves. But currently, with our educational system, it's just like, like, like the earlier speaker had said, um, I think at the beginning, it's just about coming to classroom, um, feeding yourself with this information that you can't even, you don't even understand the relevance of this information. So, and as a result of that, this also affects the, uh, the employment market because now you just have a group of people who just know how you can put X and Y right. to form Z. But uh, they don't even know how to apply those concepts in, in, in the real world. And, and that is very problematic. So our educational objective has to be in pragmatic. You know, it, it, it's more theoretical than pragmatic. So everybody just has this theoretical concepts about things, but the application of these theories become problematic. So Leandro, let me get your thoughts here. Which areas, because you're undertaking a curriculum review, which areas of the education system do you think requires a decolonizing approach? Uh, the teaching of history has been one of the greatest challenge where we have emphasized uh, European teaching. But you find that the content of the history of Uganda is uh, flooded with uh, uh, European explorers. The first man to, to the first white man to see Lake Victoria, the first white man to see Mount uh, Elgon, the first white man to see where, the first one to see the longest river. Now, is that one something that can be taught to an African young child that that is growing in the country? that should understand what is within the country. So I think this is where we need to have a radical change in, in terms of uh, teaching our local history. Because I was amazed in the United States, uh, they do not teach uh, any history of, of any other continent apart from Western Europe and America. And actually when they ask you, you said we, we only know about uh, the Suez Canal and, the, and Egypt. That is the right. history that uh, a student will competently tell you. But for us here, geography, we learn the entire world geography. We come to Uganda, but the, the, the geography of East Africa, you find it is very narrow. So those are areas of changes that we require to bring a young African intellectual that understands and has a world view of where he or she is standing from. All right, I want to get your final comment, and I'll start off with you, uh, Leandro. You know, the world being global, there are many things universal about education and education systems, and possibly some best practices that uh, cut across the board. What should these uh, that should be? What are those that can be retained, even while considering changing the education system? Because not all of it is bad, clearly, from this discussion. The world has moved. Africa has remained behind. There are many challenges we need to catch up with. So, so what is the Africa we want? What is it that we need to produce in terms of human resources that would fit the next century? And, and therefore, that now brings to us the challenges of, of reviewing these processes. And therefore, decolonization becomes the, the fulcrum or the common de denominator in determining how uh, we dovetail all these other interests. So, so for me, while I agree well, my colleague talked about science, 
Well, we, we, we need to decolonize science, but the teaching of science uh, in, uh, in our schools in Africa, I think, has been uh, very problematic. If you look at what is required, and that now goes back to individual governments in Africa. What are our priorities in terms of how the tools for processing these knowledges are concerned? I've seen in my primary school when I grew up, I started primary one, it was hard to learn because sometimes many kids were writing on the floor, you know, from the village schools. So what is the infrastructure that can facilitate this process? While we talk about the theory, I think the African governments have the greatest challenge in ensuring that our budgetary priorities must as well begin to shift because this is at the core of transforming the future of Africa. And it will require a very expensive exercise that would uh, need an input in injecting more in our annual budgets in across Africa. And therefore, it is an holistic approach we, we, we need to look at and very deliberate. Because when we say we, we would need to decolonize our education, and yet we think by reviewing and not understanding through our deliberate consciousness of what decolonizing means, then we shall get results wrong. So for me, I agree we have a long journey to walk, but we must also see from where my colleague in, uh, from South Africa stated that actually the issue about coloniality was all about conquest, domination, and getting resources. But Africa is very rich. How do we use our internal African resources to build a capacity and momentum to energize the education sector that is Afro-based, but with a world understanding that we can deploy our human resources in the world market? Because to date, if you need experts, they will always be with a lot of uh, uh, thinking around the African human resources. Uh, which university do you come from? Right. Now, all these are challenges we need to, to outgrow. And the fight will begin from us, and we take the fight to the rest of the world. Right. Peter, your uh, final thoughts? If we are talking about decolonizing our education system, and we want the competence, the competence, the skills, the question that should be on the mind of our curriculum implementers and all of us as people in Africa should be, which are these skills that are relevant? We don't want to compete, say, Japan in, in producing uh, vehicles. What competence do we need as Africans to keep us alive and to keep us relevant in this society? Be the pre-colonial education system before the colonies came taught us pottery, basketry, hunting, gathering, these skills were relevant to us. And we were using that for trading with the international trade. We're able to trade using our gold, our, our blacksmiths, and all these kind of people. Those are the competences that we now need to think about. Do we go ahead and improve on skills? For example, if it's a Maasai in mm -hmm. Kenya, must we train him to be a, a person who can, make, who can produce cars, assemble cars? Or can we train him to be a good tourist guide, to be a good hunter, to be a good person who can guide in the in tourism industry? Maybe those are the competencies we need to be talking about to inculcate in our system. And I tend to think that, uh, yes, it is time to improve our skills, to make our, our education more competent. But the question is, which competent skills do we need to make ourselves relevant in this century? Gentlemen, thank you very much for an interesting uh, conversation here. But that's all we have time for on this edition of Talk Africa. A big thank you to our panel of experts in Johannesburg, Edmund Terem Umar, PhD candidate at the University of Johannesburg. In Nairobi via Zoom, Peter Amunga, education activist. And in Kampala, Leandro Komakech, a team leader at Leandro Associate uh, Limited. Remember, you can be a part of this conversation through our social media platforms on Facebook and Twitter. And you can watch this and other editions of Talk Africa on our YouTube playlist. To join us again next week for more Talk Africa. From me, Beatrice Marshall and the team here in Nairobi. Until next time, bye-bye.